Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put on the agenda slide. Hopefully that will work. Took me a minute last time. There we go. Um, so the Oregon Food Bank is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to eliminating hunger and its root causes. Our incredible network of staff, volunteers, and partners work diligently to ensure that everyone has access to the food they need. Oregon Food Bank is also leading statewide efforts to increase resources and personal resiliency through advocacy, community food systems organizing, garden education, and nutrition education. And like I said earlier, we started these webinars to support our FEAST communities. FEAST, which stands for Food, Education, Agriculture, Solutions Together, is a community facilitated event that brings together all voices in the community to talk about food systems. Since 2009, we've hosted over 75 events in Oregon, and it's now been replicated in 12 other states. These community conversations have led to an incredible number of initiatives, like reviving granges, starting farmers markets, community gardens, and education programs. And today's theme, storytelling, came out of a desire to support you, our network, um, of folks interested in submitting a proposal to the Closing the Hunger Gap conference in September. And I've got the organizer here with us, and she's going to tell you a little bit more. Emily Becker is here. Thanks, JC. Um, Closing the Hunger Gap is a network of food banks, anti-hunger advocates, and food justice activists from across North America working to strengthen community food systems. We're trying to build a movement to transform food banks. We encourage food banks to expand their efforts beyond food handouts towards community-based empowerment initiatives that effectively collaborate with broader community food security work. We believe that food banks are uniquely positioned to be hubs for diverse community food security strategies that allow participants to gain the skills, resources, and social capital to increase their own food security and become leaders in their communities. In 2013, the Community Food Bank in Tucson, Arizona hosted the first Closing the Hunger Gap conference. That event brought together over 300 people working to transform food banks. This year, the Oregon Food Bank will host the second conference, Closing the Hunger Gap, Cultivating Food Justice, from September 13th to 16th in Portland, Oregon. This conference will bring together more than 500 attendees for a vibrant, diverse, and inspiring event where attendees will learn new skills, discuss innovative programs, and network with their peers. The conference will also provide an opportunity for attendees to strategize around the Closing the Hunger Gap priorities and help to plan the direction of our growing movement. To get involved with Closing the Hunger Gap, you can contact me at ebecker at oregonfoodbank.org or check out our website, thehungergap.org. We're currently accepting workshop proposals, and you can download the RFP at thehungergap.org slash RFP. The deadline is April 1st. Uh, we're hosting this webinar because we want to hear great stories at the conference, and we hope you will attend and share the story of your work. Thanks, Emily. And I went ahead and uh, linked to uh, the RFP and the website and your email, so um, folks can find all that information in the chat box if you didn't catch it while she was chatting. Um, and just so you know, this will be, this is recorded and will be available. So if you um, heard something that you really want to hear again, um, you will be able to in about a week. So we hope you'll consider presenting at the conference. And regardless, we hope that this will be useful to you as you begin to package what you do into a story. And um, I'm incredibly excited to introduce our uh, host. Well, I guess host is, it's funny that I said host because they are hosts of Backfence PDX, but um, our presenters today, um, ever since I moved to Portland, I've been uh, in attendance of every one of their events, so it's a, it's a pleasure. So we've got B. Frayne Masters. She's the executive producer and host of Backfence PDX storytelling series. She is also the PDX producer for the Moth Grand Slam. She has taught art, Art of Communication and Storytelling classes through Portland Center Stage Art of Business to a variety of professionals, including school teachers, bank executives, real estate agents, writers, HR personnel, ad, ad copywriters, IT, and more. She has also taught narrative improv in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle. She is a professional copywriter and scriptwriter, in addition to writing for various magazines and online entities. And I'm going to advance the slide here really quick. I should have done that. There we go. And Mindy, Mindy Nedefi is an award-winning poet and storyteller who has taught creative writing and performance classes at over 50 colleges and universities across the U.S. She is the director of the nonprofit Right Now Poets, a producer with Backfence PDX, and a host for The Moth. 
She is the author of the acclaimed writing How to, How to Guide Glitter in the Blood by Write Bloody Press and has over 13 years of experience in development and communications for nonprofit organizations. So it's a pleasure to have you both. I'm going to pass you the microphone here. And yeah, Hi. take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Morning. Good morning. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Alles gut, ja? Yeah? Yeah? I love when you speak German. Mm -hmm. The whole workshop's going to be in German. I hope you guys knew <laughs> that. I hope that's okay, that. everybody. Um, it's how I learned storytelling. Um, we really want to begin today um, by talking about the reasons that we suck as storytellers. Um, we're, you know, before we get into you know, how, how to tell a great story, um, we thought we would just begin with some, like a deep admission of the things yeah. we all do that don't work. Let's let ourselves off the hook, man. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. Um, even like if you hear a story um, that's broadcast internationally on the Moth Radio Hour, storytellers will talk about how every time they tell a story, they usually leave out a couple of facts or just, you know, it's it's yeah. always a living, breathing thing. So yeah. just, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes, and every time you tell or give a presentation, you're going to learn something new. Yeah, so let's just run down the don'ts. Let's a do it. A list of the don'ts, you know, the things that make presentations terrible. And I think, <laughs> I think number one, we can agree, uh, what makes a presentation terrible is that it drags on too long. Too long. Mm. Mm. Like the party that goes till 3 in the morning. Right. You know, it's no bueno. Yeah, it started way too far, it started way too early, and ended way too late. Mm -hmm. And the next thing would be uh, when the speaker, and I know I've done this, uh, comes on with, with an attitude of apology. Like they're taking, you know, I'm so sorry to be taking up your time. This is only going to take a few minutes, everybody. And, and they set the bar so low that it, that it can't even really be crawled under, you know. Right. So. Entering, the, entering the speaking zone, uh, standing and then starting to edge your foot off the stage, like the whole time you're speaking, like kind of moving away from the microphone, plant yeah. those feet. Yeah. Um, the next the next presentation kryptonite uh, is, of course, when, when it's just too dense, when there's too much information trying to be packed in, and you're lost immediately, you know? Right. You, uh, the human brain can really only track so many pieces of information at a time. Um, and sometimes that, that limit is not respected at all. Yeah, especially with oral. When you're speaking orally, um, uh, you've really got to limit the amount because people, <clears throat> and we're going to try to do that as we're speaking here. You can call us out if we get too convoluted. Yeah, we're going to try to be too <laughs> dense in this talk here. But, but yeah. that's why we're just going to admit it right up front. Let's get into the weeds. All right. Um, the next thing would be, um, you know, presentations are terrible when there is no emotional hook. You know, when it's it's just dry and there's a lot of facts, but nobody's bothering to tell you why you should care. And, and even if intellectually you sort of know why you should care, you find yourself drifting, you know, writing your grocery list or thinking about that, you know, weird conversation you had with your mom last night. Um, and it, it, it's not good. It's not good. So no emotional hook. Yeah. Conversely, <clears throat> yes, fine. yes. Conversely, what else can happen? What else can happen is, um, and I think uh, we've all been in front of someone who is, um, every sentence is packed uh, with corporate lingo. Mm -hmm. And the thing about corporate lingo is um, sometimes you'll be in a group of people who understand that corporate lingo and sometimes you won't. And, some t and corporate lingo can oftentimes kind of feel like you're pulling a status card on people, like you know this thing. And it also, um, it just it's lingo, so it creates a barrier. It's better in... Like how you just said pulling a status card, and nobody knew what you meant when you said that. It's that was true. a little bit of storytelling jargon. It was I brilliant did. that you demonstrated it. I did. I demonstrated it by doing right it. there. Yeah. Um, and um, so you want to you just keep it conversational. That's mm. really, really important. That is going to have way more impact than big words. Oftentimes, people using big words, it's more about themselves trying to feel good about their talk rather than trying to communicate something. So that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, of course, sometimes sometimes people do bring an emotional hook to the story that they're trying to tell, but it, it's seemingly unattached to the actual message um, of the story, you know? Right. Um, so sometimes people do share and they, you know, they sort of bring in something big from their own lives. 
Um, but it ends up just kind of being an embarrassing moment for everybody uh, because they're maybe telling a story about um, their struggle with alcoholism, um, but, you know, you're at a food conference and maybe not at a conference that would be about alcoholism where that story would make perfect sense. It's really got to help bring this, the point home of your data and your facts. Yeah, and this brings me to the next thing that makes presentations suck, which is not knowing what your main point is, not knowing what you're there to say. Um, it's If you don't have a main point, if you don't have a key message, um, then you have nothing to do but drift. There's, you right. know, um, if you don't know what you're trying to say, you can't expect your audience to, to get it. Um, and it's, it's uh, amazing how many times all of us have been there where we just didn't really solidify the why. Why am I talking right now? Why am I presenting these facts? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And that's just... Um, something to always continually work on and focus on. Yeah, of course. And the very final thing we want to bring up about why presentations suck is, you know, sometimes you hear an incredible presentation and you're so pumped, you're psyched. And then there's no sort of action steps presented at the end of that. Um, you have nowhere to go with that excitement. Um, you're left dangling uh, off of the a cliff of your own making. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, I think that's fair to say. I think, you know, what you want to do is is when you do keep it um, clear action steps, then people have definite ways to ask you questions at the end. Um, if it gets too convoluted, then they don't know where to begin asking I, you questions. Know, and that's it. That's our presentation, Kryptonite. We're, we're going to move on and talk about the things to do, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities to ask uh, questions. Um, but we, we wanted to just kind of you know, we wanted to start in the dregs so that we, there was nowhere to go but up. That's right. That was our icebreaker. Um, so right. now, um, this, right. this first sort of, we have three segments we're going to discuss storytelling in. Um, the first one is structure and flow. The second is going to be engagement and impact. And the third is going to be called leave them wanting more. Let's start with structure and flow. Yes. So let's get to the basics. Um, here we are in structure and flow. Um, we typically like to work off of a five-part pretty standard structure when coaching people with stories. Um, and how it works is um, the first part is you want to set up um, the world just the baseline of the world before things began to change or before you're driving towards the change that you want. And then... You're going to set the scene. You're going to set the scene, yes. And then you're going to have a catalyst or you're going to demonstrate the thing that um, starts to change that world, the problem that needs to be solved, the conflict that happens next. Yeah. Something's going to happen. That, that's the second thing. Anything, anything has to happen. Right, and that's the thing that will create the tension, start to create the tension in your story, the, the surprise in your story, the I want to know what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. and that leads to the raising of the stakes. This is like where you just start, you um, start piling on the difficulties of, of how you're going to get to where you want to get to, mm -hmm. um, that, that keeps the tension in the story, and again, um, keeps the, the emotional content high in the story. Yeah, so part, part one of the story is setting the scene, part two is the catalyst, something happens, and then part three, which is probably going to be sort of the bulk, the meat in the yes. middle story, is, is what Fran just said, which is called raising the stakes. Um, it's where things get worse, you know, or uh, things kind of start piling on, incidents pile on other incidents. Um, and that takes us to the fourth part of a story. Which is the turning point. The turn, turn, turn. Yeah, that That's where wrong. we start, where there's kind of a surprise or an aha moment in the story. And this is very important because mm. the beginning of your story, you're driving the whole time to this aha moment. What changed? What shifted? And now you're going to get to the world as it is now. And, and so there's a question asked at the turning point, like, um, you know, are things changing or are they not? And how, what's the world now? Do we have problems that we've solved or problems that we still need to solve? Okay. And how is the world changed from the beginning of our story till the end of our right. story? So part four of the story structure is called the turn. You know, you can think of it as the climax as well, but, but it's better to think of it as the turn because it's, it's where things change. 
Um, and then part five, as Fran just said, is the world as it is now. What's different? What has changed? How have you changed because of the story? How do you see things different? Um, and how have things changed for your audience, too? Can you relate that back to your audience in some kind of way? Can you make that a universal message to them? You can, you can tell any story with these five parts. And one of the things I want to drive home um, that a lot of people mistake maybe or maybe wouldn't think of until you start doing a lot of storytelling live and orally um, is the importance of chronological order. Yes. Um, what works on the page or kind of switching back or, or maybe what you would do with a friend where you're suddenly like, uh, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you this one thing. Okay, hold on. I got to go back into. No flashbacks. There should be no flashbacks. Um, you should be, you know, prepping this five part story. You should be planning it in chronological order. And that's because that is how the brain wants to receive that story. How their brains want to receive the information is in order. Um, so forget any sort of colorful things that might work in other kinds of storytelling or writing or what might work in film. Or what might, you know, when you're telling an oral story, you're going to tell it in order. This happened, and then this happened next, and this is why that's important. And then this happened next, and this is why that's important. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to say something else in regards to that. What was it? Oh, uh, so hard it'll to come tell. back to me. I'm not psychic this morning, but I'm, I'm not psychic either. Work on that. Um, well, let's yeah. let's talk about what 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 is a great opening? What is a great opening? A great opening can be because you guys, I know, are um, you're sometimes working with data or. Um, facts mm. or, you know, different kinds of pie charts, pie charts, different mm -hmm. kinds of things like that. And I know that a question that comes up a lot is how, you know, what, how can you grab an audience's attention right away? How can you hook them in? Mm. And sometimes when you're working with data, what you can do is you can take a big piece of data, a surprising piece of data, and you can show that first rather than building up to it and tell the story behind it because that will grab people right away and they'll want to know oh, what's that story about? How did we reach that data point? And that can be um, a way to really set it off and to really start you off into the, you know, you can take that data and then go back because that's kind of maybe, it might be your turning point or it might be your world as it is at the end of your story. Um, but then... It might just be your main point. might just yeah. be your main point, but it can grab people right away and they're going to want to know. So you, sometimes you yeah. might have data. It's like that. And this is similar so. to something we talk about um, in live storytelling for the moth or at Backfence when we work with storytellers, which is you want to start as close to the action as possible. We know we told you that, the, that part one of the story is, is the world as it is now and setting the scene. That shouldn't take very long, okay? Uh, you do need to kind of set a baseline. But if your story is a roller coaster, you know, and, and people are going to sort of climb up all the way to the top of that run, you want to start them at the top of the roller coaster right before they drop and go down. You don't really want to spend a lot of time. I, I know you think there needs to be a lot of setup often. You think there's a lot of explanation that needs to happen. You know what? There isn't a lot of explanation that needs to happen. Um, you want to start close to the action. That's what hooks people in. So in the case of a presentation, you know, kind of story, I, I, I think what Frank said is great, that often that sort of that big heartbreaking statistic, you know, that is for you, it could be that's the action of the story. Um, and you put that right at the beginning, um, and then you get into it. Yeah, and I think if you're breaking, you know, um, you can take the five-part structure, and I think it's important to start looking at, um, using that structure to break your time down. Yeah. So that peak of the roller coaster, that opening world is sometimes three sentences, just three sentences long. Um, you probably don't want it to be any longer than a minute. So you really got yeah. to um, focus focus that because that's how you grab people. Yeah. Like because you, you just make that part short and succinct to get to that catalyst point. Yeah. Well, and. and for a concrete example, I know this is probably starting to feel pretty abstract to some of you. Um, I have, uh, the very first time I got on stage to tell a story, I decided I was going to tell a, sto a story about the first time I cast, um, I was like 13 and I tried to cast a love spell on a boy I had a crush on. Um, and this is, there's a lot of ridiculous things about this story. Um, 
But the way I decided to go in is just at the very beginning, I said, um, I think I started it, uh, first of all, uh, his name was Anthony. Um, and I very briefly introduced who Anthony was, and then I got into the bananas thing that happened. Um, and, and, that, and I only think of that now because I think probably a lot of you are going to be telling stories about a client that you're working with or someone that you met, um, something that happened to you that got you into the work that you're doing now, that changed the way you saw things. So you're often going to be introducing a really important character right at the beginning. Um, and you, it can just be starting out, you know, first of all, uh, his name was Mark, and this happened. You know, it doesn't need to be a huge setup. You don't have to tell us a lot about Mark. I don't know where that name came from. <laughs> um, it's a good name. Well, anyway, I hope that helps a little, and I'm sure you're all dying to know now how that love spell worked out. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later, uh, but Frank, why don't you real quick yeah, we'll talk start. about expanding versus advancing. All right, so expanding and advancing are the two qualities that every story needs. You need both of those qualities, and it turns out that you, most people, are prone to be either largely an expander or largely an advancer. And what you've what got do is expanders do, Frank. Expanders, uh, they just go into the details. Like the expander mm. is that friend of yours um, that can talk forever about just salsa <laughs> and just all the ingredients that are in salsa. Right, and that salsa they had last night. Yes. And then, yes. Yeah. Two months ago. And your friend, who is um, the ardent advancer, mm. is the person who um, who just gives you. They talk about they went to Europe and they um, they just kind of give you the bare minimum facts about every right. single bullet point place that they went to and they don't expand yeah. on it yeah, at all. Yeah, you got the plot, but you can't, you can't see it. You're being given no visuals or details. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, I think it's important to kind of really start to think about which one of those things you are because you kind of got to bring the other, the one that you aren't more of into your storytelling abilities. Yeah, and that's just something that, weak muscle. that you're going to continue to work on. And I really want to emphasize through this whole thing that storytelling is, <clears throat> excuse me, is a living thing. You're always going to be working on it, and you can always, that's why we started with the mistakes, because you're always <clears throat> growing with it, <clears throat> including um, getting things in your throat and growing with those. <laughs> um, so expanding and advancing, that describes the basic flow of storytelling. If we gave you a structure to start out with, what we're talking about now is how your story is going to flow. First, you're going to advance. You know, you're going to start with a plot and you're going to move it forward. You're going to tell us what happened. But every once in a while, you're going to stop and you're going to, you're going to expand a little bit on something you just said, either by painting out a scene with some details. Um, Personal or reflection. Having a moment of reflection, you know. Um, being like, oh, and here's what I was thinking at that moment. Here's how I was feeling at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all of this, of course, is moving towards landing your finish, like Nadia Comaneci, um, the great lander of our time. <laughs> yes. If you are not familiar with her, uh, she's a gymnast that you can Google later. Yeah, Google her. Let's keep her she alive. She got the first tens. Mm. Just, just beautiful with the landings. Um, she stuck it. When I go to tell a story live, there's three things I know going in at least, and that is how I'm going to start. I often memorize you know, how I'm going to begin a story. I know where I'm going to begin. I know what my turn is going to be. I know what the surprise or the aha is I'm moving towards. And thirdly, I know how I'm going to finish because the rest can kind of go wherever, and my story might change from time to time that I tell it with the details I expand on or what my audience. Me. <clears throat> right. Um, but I'm the only, I know I'm going to land my finish if I know what it's going to be at the beginning, and I know I'm driving towards that. Um, and it's something you really want to give thought to ahead of time because, of course, that's your moment to give your moral of the story, to say, this is how things change. This is why I'm different. Um, and this is how the world is different now. And, of course, in the case of giving a presentation, and this is what I'm going to do about it. This is what we can do about it next. Yeah, and that really relates back to that thing that we talked about at the top, which is um, the thing about apologizing for being there. You really, when you know that finish, you're going to be there, you're going to take your time, and you're going to drive towards that finish. And when you do finish, 
it's also really important to get used to just really truly sticking your landing and being there for that moment and letting the final part of your story wash over your audience. Um, a lot of people tend to like um, immediately apologize when they're done. Like they'll, they'll finish say, and they'll be like, and they'll kind you. of crumple or finish and say, thank you. Uh, thank you. And then, you know, close it out and, and leave. Right. Know, and it's, I, it's, it's like hold your ground, stick your ground and believe in what you said. That's why it's really important to know that why I'm here. And you've just, yeah. you know, listen, just sometimes stand there and wait for the standing ovation Yeah, <laughs> for it in your mind sometimes, but <laughs> nonetheless, you've got to wait for it. Um, and, and it's really, really important to get used to that because you've really got to learn to own the story that you're telling from the moment you hit the stage to several moments after you're finished speaking because mm -hmm. it always takes people a moment to ask questions. You know, if you've gone to any reading at, at a bookstore, people will finish reading and there's always this weird shuffly moment until there's a first question and you just kind of, you got to just kind of calmly ride that out and be chill with it. Just yeah. be really confident with that ending. It's really going to change the impact of your story, um, the way you embody it. Mm -hmm. It's going to keep people's attention in a very different way than if you're kind of always like edging off stage like we talked about. I think on that note, I think we should take a couple questions Let's do now. it. Let's do it. What, what do we got here? All right, folks, this lot. is your opportunity to type in some questions. I do have one that came in, so we'll start with that one. Okay. Um, and I'm going to hand the math up. Oh, I'll give it to you in a second. <laughs> we love what we do, and we want to tell everyone everything about it. Do you have any tips for picking what to leave out? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, listen, of course, of course you want to tell everyone everything because you are excited about it, and that is completely natural and normal, um, but it just becomes a thing where each time you present, you've got to pick one thing. It's just, it's just the way it's got to be um, because, and then you've got to allow any kind of, of the other parts of your message or the other parts of your story have to come out in Q&A or in any kind of other materials or website that you have. You've got to tell an impacting part of the story that makes people want to learn more about your story, essentially. I, I suppose I could imagine a case where, you know, so many organizations, for example, have many programs, you know. Right. You might have six or seven programs, um, and you might be asked to give a talk about your organization, and of course you want to mention every single uh, great program you have and, and every success story that's happening. Um, and what you really want to do, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, um, so you want to make sure that there's a place where people can find out all that information, but for the presentation you're giving, you're going to hone in on um, one program, one key effort, um, one message you guys are working on right now, one success story that happened, um, or one challenge that you're facing. Um, you're you're, you're going to hone it down. and. All the setup you think that needs to happen before that, an explanation of how this problem came to be, all the things you would have to think about, for example, if you were writing a grant, okay, none of that matters when you're telling an oral storyteller, you know, we have 10 minutes to give this presentation. You're just, you're, you're going to keep it to the one thing and make sure people can find other information. If they want to know the history of it, if they want to know more, or they want to know about your other programs, they can find out. But you're going to keep your presentation to really just the bare facts, well not the bare facts, right. but really to the one key message. Um, I'm trying to think, I think, you know when we talk about storytelling with people just telling a story, one of the things we bring, we, we remind people is people can own, the audience will only be able to track two to three tops names. Okay, so if you have a lot of characters, if there's a lot going on, um, you're going to have to decide who's the two main people or the three main people in the story, and everyone else is going to just become so-and-so's uncle or the neighbor. They're not going to have names anymore because nobody's going to remember it. It's going to start to get really confusing. And I think you could apply that rule here. Just people are really only going to be able to track, you know, the two to three, you know, main kind of characters or things that are happening. So... That should be what you drive towards, and yeah. down to that. Yeah, and I think that it's really important that whatever the two or three things that you're driving towards, <clears throat> that you really name those things, and then you continually name those things every time. 
Um, people get sometimes lost in the world of pronouns or um, saying things in vague ways, and you've really got to, you know, if, if you're talking about, you know, um, three people or, again, three facts, just keep repeating those facts and relate back to those facts every single time because it's oral and it just really let, allows your audience to relax. Mm -hmm. you're, you're leading them along and um, they will understand it. It's kind of like if you think about um, what happens when, when um, a novel gets made into a movie, that you just have to, they have to pare down the facts. They have to condense and they have to cut things. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're thinking take, about. Take three people in the story and turn them into one Hugh Grant. Yes, that's what, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Um, and uh, we can touch on this more in a bit, but just on the other side of it, think about, you know, you're, you have pride in your organization, which is wonderful. Think about what you want your audience, what's the story that you want them to be able to repeat? Mm -hmm. So they aren't going to be able to repeat everything that happens in your organization, but what's the core message? What's the core thing or things that you want them to go like, oh, uh, I, they got it, and now I can tell other people about this thing. I'm so, yeah. I, the, the aha moment was clear, and I can repeat that message easily. Sometimes so. I like to imagine I'm a really important politician um, for, you know, one or the other parties, you know, and that I have a really amazing, expensive communications manager, you know, who's giving me my three talking points, and I stray from those talking points, I am going to lose the presidency, okay? <laughs> and I think it's important that we make it that high stakes for ourselves, you know? Imagine, because it's easy to see, we see politicians do this successfully all the time, stay on message, and it's annoying, but what do you remember at the end? You remember the message. Um, and so that's that's what we're going to be. We're going to be, you know, candidates in the dramas of our lives. Yes. Next question. Next question. <laughs> All right. This is, I'm, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about this one. Um, Me too. Okay. In preparation, should the story be written out? And how do you marry the written story to spoken word? Oh, excellent. Great question. Awesome question. Thank you for feeding right into our what we want to talk about. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say real quick, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, everybody works a little bit differently. Um, some people really need to write it out first. And if that's you, if you really need to kind of write this out, do it. That's okay. Um, cause we are going to move, uh, in another section, if we can talk about it now, sure. which is, uh, the importance of practicing. Um, one of the processes I would move someone through who wanted to write their whole story out first, for example, just because they really, that they need to in order to truly be able to articulate what they want to articulate, they need to go through that process. Um, so first I have them write it all out, and then I have them read it to me off of the page, and I time it, okay? And usually at that point we're at, say I'm trying to get somebody to tell a seven-minute story, um, usually the first thing they write out and read to me is about 30 minutes. And I know that's crazy, true. but it's, you it's know, true. it takes a long time to read something off the page. Um, but we take that. Well, and that's also because I tell people at the beginning, write big, go long. Try to get all the details out that you think are important and then step back from it and figure out what you can cut out. Um, and as from just, <clears throat> just, just factually, a seven-minute story is about 1,300 words, so it's not long. There you go, 1,300 words for seven minutes. Now, depending, you, you guys can do the math from there, depending on what time your presentation is going to be. But right. from, from there, um, we identify uh, what we think can kind of be cut or what we think the main parts of the story are that need to stay in. Um, and then I have them turn that thing they wrote into uh, an outline. And that outline is something you could take with you, for example, to your presentation where you go, wow, here's the 10 beats. That's what we, that's what we call it in the biz. We call it a beat. Yes. Here's the beats I'm going to hit. And those, um, those fit right into that five-part structure. They are that's following right. 
they're just going to go right That's under right. those headers. Here's the two beats I want to hit at the beginning. Here's the, you know, and then here's what happened, and here's the beats I want to hit. And it's really just taking that story that you've written out and turning it into an outline. And then you practice with the outline. You have to abandon at that point um, the big, long thing you've written out. And you just rehearse the heck out of it. Um, yeah, and I, I totally recommend, like, do, and it's really important that you don't, again, I'm just going to stress this, that you do not rehearse with that whole written out piece, only the bullet points. Because what happens is, if you memorize rather than knowing by heart, you have no fluidity in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. And memorize things, all you're trying to do is remember the words rather than the intention behind them. And there's a huge mm -hmm. difference between those two things. Yeah. And as cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs as this might sound, um, what I have storytellers do when they move to the point where they have the outline is I have them go into a room by themselves and tell the story like four times in a row, just out loud, um, full, because yeah. there's I just, like to do it in my car. In your car, whatever, just mm -hmm. what, alone, not in front of anybody else giving you notes. Mm -hmm. What happens is um, that you kind of... At first, you'll do it, and I bet your breath will be caught up in your throat when you're first even telling it to yourself out loud. But then you kind of, you know, release at some point, like the third time through, and it just starts to become a part of your body, and that's what you're trying to get it to be. And um, the more you do this, it actually will make you a better extemporaneous speaker as well. You just start to get used to your own rhythm of speaking things in a more condensed way, in a more driving way. And um, it really, really works. And I think it's important also um, to, I guess, well, I'll just talk about this here because we're in it. So um, um, <laughs> it's like for a 10-minute story, like let's say you're going to do a 10-minute presentation, write it to be seven minutes because with this kind of knowing it by heart thing, you're going to start to react off of the audience. You're going to probably add some things depending on where you'll start to learn um, where the audience is really responding to things, maybe you can throw another fact in there, or moving on from something that doesn't seem to be resonating with the audience. Yeah. So. Great advice, Frank. Thank advice. you, Mindy. Yeah. I thought you were really clear. Do we have, do we have time for one more, maybe? Sure. So. Okay. This is, a, this is a really important part. So. And I do, um, I did receive a number of questions that I think you might maybe address in engagement and impact, and if not, I'll bring those questions back in. Okay. Um, but one kind of logistical question I think might echo strongly for a lot of people on the call right now is, what advice do you have to help us talk more about the impact of our mission, people, rather than statistics, data, pounds distributed, number of counties, et cetera? I'm not sure if that's something you feel like you can answer, but I'm going to pass the mic your way and see what you come up with. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know what? Just leave the statistics and data out of it. I mean, you can have one... This sort of brings into this sort of like how to use PowerPoint effectively, mm -hmm. um, which is another question. Oh, great. Yeah, great. Weird psychic abilities um, over here. So one of the things I'm sure you're going to be doing giving presentations is having PowerPoints. Um, and, and this is, you know, all you, you don't want to have a lot of stuff for people to read on a PowerPoint slide. You just want visuals. You want, you know, cats carrying, you know, rainbow sabers. Um, you know, funny things that will also get a message across. Um, so, but that doesn't mean you can't put a, a pie chart, for example, up or a graph up that has a statistic. And you kind of like let that hang as the visual if you want for what it is you're talking about. But since you've already got probably this incredible website for your organization that has all of these beautiful statistics and numbers on it already, um, unless your actual, unless the point of your presentation is to present this sort of, you know, a research project that you just did, in which case people are actually there to hear specifically the results of the data and facts, you really don't need to bring it in at all. Um, these are you're probably, you know, in most cases preaching to the choir. You're probably talking to other people in your in in the business. Um, maybe you're not. Maybe you're you're doing outreach to um, potential donors who have no idea. And in that case, you know, pick 
pick just three simple statistics that aren't too complicated to understand um, and that put things in digestible bits of information, you know. Um, a lot of, you know, a football, <laughs> football, the football field rule. You have to be able to put a number or piece of data into something that people can picture or understand visually from their own lives. Um, yeah, and I'd just like to expand on that by oh, saying... do it. I'm going to. Just um, by saying that the, fo the football rule is really about metaphor. So if you can turn your data into some kind of metaphor, some kind of thing that actually can be a visual thing that's another way for people to tell this tell, repeat your story is if you have a great metaphor if, the, if your statistic is surprising yeah. so um, if your statistic is I'm just making this up um, one out of three children in my city are going to bed hungry every single night now that's an incredibly upsetting uh, hooking statistic to begin with um, but from there you could also then say you know think about it um, think of Think of one kid that you know. Um, think of your own kid. Maybe your own kid's not hungry, uh, but maybe they're in a class of 30 kids at school. Ten of those kids in that class are going to bed. You know, whatever you can, try to bring it into a concrete detail or metaphor that helps people picture it in their own lives. Yes. Um, yeah. And, well, I mean, let's, I think it's time. Let's just move on to the next section. Um, since this plays right into that, which is about engagement and impact. Um, and we set that up uh, with a little, little quote um, that said, uh, the, music, the music of story is conflict. Yes. Um, Frank, where did these quotes come from, by the way? Um, they come from a weighty tome called Story. Mm. It's very, very condensed. Uh, should you ever want to really dive into every single dynamic of story, it's uh, it's an amazing book. Yeah. So. so the most important thing, of course, you guys, the, the whole point of what you're doing is that you want to have an impact on the people that are listening to you. And the very, the most important thing, the very first thing that you can do to make sure that you engage your audience and have an impact um, is your own attitude. Um, so I just want to really drive this home at first. If you walk up and you think, oh, these people don't want to hear what I'm saying, they're exhausted, we've been at this conference forever, they're just here because they have to be, you know, or, oh, I see those two people, I know they hate me, um, and you walk up there thinking the audience doesn't want to hear what you have to say, and you're not even sure you want to hear what you have to say, um, you're going to give one of the worst presentations of your life. Conversely, if you imagine that uh, everybody loves you because you're amazing and you're an incredible speaker and that they're all incredibly pumped and, man, they sure do look tired, but that's just because they are tired. But they, on the inside, they are psyched to see you. And you walk out there thinking, this is, you know, these people love me, and you know what? I like them, too. I really like the people that showed up to hear this presentation. I feel like they're really going to understand me. And uh, this is a really important presentation I'm about to give. Um, you walk out there, like, pumped and excited about what you're doing um, and sort of with a great attitude about yourself, your presentation in the audience, you're going to have, no matter what happens, you're going to have an incredible presentation. So if you want to have an impact on the people you're talking to, you have to start with, like, kind of, you know, respect for yourself and for them and your time there um, and, and go in feeling good about it, you know. So everybody's got a little routine they go through before yeah, and a presentation think, or a story in order to create and cultivate this attitude. Frayn, admit to them what you do. Um, yeah, well, Wow. <laughs> just put me on the spot. Um, no, but you, it, it, it is, and uh, I'm just going to reemphasize Mindy's reemphasization. Oh, interesting. Uh, a new word that I've created for everyone to write down and use. You don't want to tell them about how you listen to Prince, uh, <laughs> the entire, you know, Diamonds and Pearls? I do, actually, uh, before I go on stage, I do have a routine, and I think it's really important, and it, it's going to be individual to you. Like, I have a friend who um, is an amazing actress. Mm. Do you like how I deflected it to somebody else's yeah, process? I know um, that. Um, <laughs> um, and she goes through this whole thing about like she, you know, she's going on stage in front of a lot of people to do a one-person show, 
she has an hour long thing that she does before every show where she goes into this world of like, I'm going to die one day. And, um, you know, and it can be as crazy as you want it to be. But you've, if you're going to be presenting a lot and really have impact, you've really got to discover this process. And for me, um, a lot of it has to do when I'm driving there. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a party and like I'm going to, we're going to have a really good time and I'm really going to look at people and I'm not going to be afraid to connect to them. And um, that's another thing. If, if you've got a decent sized group of people, break the audience into a quadrant and work the four quadrants of the room while you're speaking. Even if you have notes in front of you, you've got to look up. Because um, the question earlier about how do you move back and forth between written parts and kind of more extemporaneous parts, in the extemporaneous parts, and even in the written parts, you've just got to start training yourself to look up at people, because mm -hmm. that's really what draws people in. And when you look at a quadrant of 50 people, everybody in that quadrant thinks you're looking at them. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a, a trick to keep, you know, to keep that going. But um, it's going back to, because okay. I kind of trailed okay. off there for a minute, um, going back to the process of it, it can also be about your day. Maybe you had a hard day. Maybe somebody gave you a hard piece of information. And in the business, we call leaving your troubles at the stage door. And that's what you've got to do before you present. And sometimes you do have to fake it a little bit at the beginning, your intent. You know, like, I'm, I'm having a good time, and, like, I'm really going to connect with these people. But it's an, you just have to set, set that intention, and then that will become how you're presenting and it'll be how people are perceiving you, and you'll just roll away the troubles of the day. And One of the things I do before I get up to talk to people is I, uh, I tell myself uh, that I'm never going to have to do it again. This is it. This is the last time I'm going to do this. Uh, you know, like maybe I'm in a terrible mood or I'm in a bad place, and I just I sit myself down and I go, this is it. You know, you never have to do this again. You just have to do it this one time. And having said that, this is it. This is this is the last time you're going to get a chance to tell these people what matters to you. Um, and I, I literally psych myself out that way. Um, and, and it's fun because there's a little truth to it. Every time you go, could actually be the last time you have to get, you know. Sure. Could be the last time you get the chance to talk about it. Um, I think I want to segue real quick to another thing that's important with engagement, and that is adjusting for the audience that Absolutely. you're with. Um, you can have one presentation or story that you've prepared, um, but of course, sometimes you walk in and you realize, oh, nobody told me uh, these were going to be high school students I was talking to, or oh, wow, this is a different crowd than I'm used to for whatever reason that is, um, and or, or suddenly you're going to have to give that presentation to donors, for example, um, you know, like really wealthy donors, and you're, you know, that's, oh God, that's really different than talking to my colleagues, or, um, and I think the first thing to say about that is you can't adjust for your audience if you don't know who your audience is. So on the one hand, if you show up and it's just, it's a completely different audience than you expected, um, just chill out, you know, take a deep breath and remind yourself the most important thing is to be present. Um, and as you're giving your, you know, speech, sort of show up, you know, look at people as you're talking to them, notice if it's landing, what you're saying. Um, if you need to give extra room for questions because you're not sure if you're presenting correctly for this audience, then work that, you know, you can stop and work that more into your presentation. You can stop after a few minutes and say, um, does anybody have any questions right now, or am I, you know, is there anything about this right now that's making sense, or engage them somehow in order to figure out where you're standing. Now, if you know ahead of time, of course, ideally, uh, who your audience is going to be, um, then you can adjust. Um, and this is such a big topic, and we have so little time, I'm not going to get into specifically, you know, for example, what some do's and don'ts are for talking to mega rich people, um, although we all wish we knew exactly what those magic words were. Um, <laughs> but the important thing to remember is that uh, with donors, uh, you know, people give to people, not to causes. And this is going to apply to almost anyone you're talking to. You know, they want to, they're there to connect with you. Now, you're there for your cause, um, but there's a lot of great causes out there. You know, there's a lot of things to care about. The thing that's going to make them care about it is you. 
So if you show up and you decide you, you care about this audience and you want to connect with them and communicate and, and you sort of show up for that and are prepared for that, um, they're going to want to connect back with you and your, your story is going to work. You're going to be able to make those adjustments by, yeah, by literally just being present and um, letting them see you and hear you and connect to you. Um, is there anything you want to say about adjusting for audience before we... I think that was really clear. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things we wanted to talk about in engagement and impact was... Um, I'm just going to bring these three things up and then I'm going to set frame loose on all of you, which is um, how to use a Q&A effectively. So whether that's at the very end of your presentation or woven in, the Q&A can be a huge part of, of sort of how your story is able to really engage the audience. Um, and that includes, uh, number one, staying on message, and number two, what to do when you're thrown. What to do when someone asks you a question that is purposefully trying to throw you off your message. So, Frank, why don't you talk real quick about, you know, what are some great tips for All Q&As right. and, and staying on that. message and what to do when someone just throws a bone your way. All right. Um, so this is going to tie right back into the thing of, um, knowing why you're on stage and really owning the stage when you're up there and staying as positive as you can be because people will ask questions that throw you and the thing is is it's again plant your feet and stay chill and mm -hmm. like if that question throws you um, it might be allow it to kind of wash over you did you learn something from that question? Maybe it actually piques a curiosity in you. Sometimes it just strikes the fear into you because um, you don't know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. What do you, what do, you do when you, you don't know how to answer a question? Frank? You can just say, um, you know what, that's a really great question. And that um, puts a new perspective on this to me. And I, although I can't answer it right now, I'm going to think more about that. But I just really, that opened up a new window for me that I hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. Because you're acknowledging the person and you've dealt, you've handled the question in a very calm way. You haven't set yourself off course. You haven't. Sometimes we try to answer questions that we don't really know the answer to, mm -hmm. and that can really lead you off course and kind of allow. That's when rambling kind of sure. comes in, because like maybe you don't have a statistic for that or the exact answer. But well, and then you know you can. You one know. of the things we talk about in communications is um, when you have to you have to be careful about answering questions because. If you decide to answer someone's question straightforwardly, um, you're acknowledging that the premise of their question is true. So one of the things they train you to do in communications, um, this is back to you being a candidate for the presidency and say it, reporters are attacking you with questions. Um, the most important thing is to first, is to he really hear the question someone just asked and ask yourself, do I agree or disagree? with the premise of the question they're asking. And if you don't like the premise, or that's, or that's what's really kind of taking off board, then deny the premise, you know? You can just sort of say, you know what, um, I hear you, and that's really interesting, but uh, I don't think that's what we're talking about right now, and I'm certainly not, you know? You can find a way of sort of denying the premise at that point and moving on mm -hmm. without, without being a jerk to the person. Right. Because you know? yeah. sometimes people ask you, that, and you can also just, just as an exercise, just always pretend that people have the best of intentions. Because sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't realize they're asking a question that's going to throw you. And if you just kind of, you just like answer it like, oh, you know, you had a good intention with that. I, you know, I don't think that's where we're going. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, all good. I'm trying to think of, a, of an example of a, is there, if you ever, what's an example mm. of a question that's really thrown you? Um, where someone's sort of come out of nowhere. Um, tell us about how you prepare for that. No, I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and you did good. What you did when I asked you to tell people in something incredibly private that you didn't want to talk about um, is you demonstrated this really well, which is you, um, you sort of said, well, that's really interesting, and then you redirected to something you did want to talk about. Right. And that's exactly the skill we're talking about here. You can sort of acknowledge, but you don't have to answer. It, you can answer, I don't know, uh, but you can also just not answer and you can redirect and go back to what your key message is. Um, we are definitely going over time already. It's 11.25, so let's, let's just take note real quick. Um, I think it's time to take some more questions. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and, and we've covered so much uh, in the previous question answering session about our last uh, segment, which was leave them wanting more, um, that, it, you know, we already talked about how to practice and how to prepare, which is what we were going to talk about in that section. Um, so I feel like we, we've pretty much covered all, you know, all of our points. And we have, we have three points that we, you know, want to circle back to to leave you guys with. But we're going to take a few questions first. And we'll just sort of a little closing statement, if you will. Yeah. Brian, I have a really easy one to start with. And it was, um, what book was the quote? What was the it's quote called book? Story. Okay. And it's mainly, um, it's, it's largely geared towards, um, oh, it's largely, it's called Story, and it's largely geared towards screenwriters. Mm -hmm. But it just, it's really, um, it's an incredibly dense, very well-written book. It's really, it's pretty engaging. If you go to really Amazon.com like and type in Story and search under books, it should be the very first one that comes yeah. up, even though there's a lot that have that in the title. Yeah. It's just that one word. Okay, so another question that I think would fit well under this section under engagement is how does body language play into this? Oh, so um, that's a good question. It's it, it's kind of an expansion on what we're talking about with really planting yourself. Um, there have been these points where I've been in front of audiences where all of a sudden I'm really aware of my arms and like what my arms are doing and all of a sudden it's like, wow, why are my arms disconnected from my body? And it's kind of, again, I think, you know, cut yourself a break with that it's a process. And if, if how you're standing is a thing that you need to work on, then you're just going to try different things each time and figure out the thing. Like, for me, a lot of times having a podium or a music stand in front of me just makes me feel more comfortable. There's just something about... Um, not being quite as exposed that makes me, like in having the papers in front of me on something where I'm not holding something, um, holding the papers, it just makes me feel more comfortable. And um, the other thing is that process, that preparation process that we talked about. Um, you know, I, I actually do do like plank and push-ups before I go on stage because... Now we're getting the real answers. Now we're getting the real answers. Train um, process. My process. Um, and you've just got to discover what it what makes you super relaxed whether it's doing some yoga whether it's um, being driving in your car and screaming so that your breath gets down to your belly button you want to get your breath all the way down to your belly button that will allow you to speak from the core of your gut a lot of times what happens when people get on stage is they're breathing from their collarbone up and that has um, a big impact on how you're speaking as well it really makes you look immediately nervous and uncomfortable um, so yeah. you've got to figure out how to stand your ground, and it comes with practice. So here's four things anybody can do. Um, number one, one, if you're feeling nervous before you speak, um, the way the body wants to physically release fear and tension is by trembling and shaking. So away from everybody out of sight, off state, you know, or somewhere, you literally can shake it off. So literally shake it off and do something some kind of erratic. The more erratic the shaking is, the more it will actually drain the anxiety from your body before you get on stage. Um, when you're on stage, look up. Don't look down. You know, find us if you want. Find a spot in the room that's kind of above everyone's heads. You can look at. They're not going to know if you're, you know, right. who you're looking at. Uh, but try to look up as you're talking. I know you'll have to refer to your notes sometimes, but as much as possible, look up. Um, can I just can I put a little asterisk on that? Oh, okay. Uh, don't look up at the ceiling and don't look down at the ground. So look up is kind of look oh, out. Great, so. great clarification, <laughs> so. Crane. Great. Don't look at the ceiling. Um, all right. The third thing is um, try not to move too much. I mean, unless you are a trained dramatic actor. Um, the movement of your body actually drains energy from what you're saying and, and sort of the power of your voice and your words. So see if you can, when you're practicing, stay contained in your body. Now having said that, number four, when you do, if you stay contained, when you do use your hands, it will make a point. It will have an impact. So practice not moving too much while you're speaking. And then when you're rising towards the most important, impactful things you want to say, that's when you can move your hands and arms a little bit. And asterisks, my acting teacher used Great. to say, 
If you are shifting on stage, you seem shifty. You mm. don't seem as reliable. Your information will not yeah. be taken as seriously. Great tips from the world of acting. Yeah, of acting. All right. Yes. Next question. All right. So I've got one that's um, pretty specific to the conference, and I hope it's okay that I'm adding it in here. Um, I'm planning a workshop for the conference with three presenters from three different organizations. We all work together on a project. How can we tell our story together? Do you have any ideas about how to get people from different places telling their story in an effective way? Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, you love having more than one person on stage. I do, and that's when we get into what, a little bit of a... When does it work? When it's like a choral arrangement. Hmm. You kind of have to think about it like a choral arrangement. What you've got to do is those three people have, still have to decide on those five story points. Mm -hmm. You still have to create one cohesive story together. You have to decide you know, amongst those three people what those three main points you're hitting are. Maybe each of you are hitting one of those points so that when it goes to that person, they're driving home their specific point. Um, and then that's going to be a thing where it's got to be choreographed out a little bit more. You've got to decide. Yeah. You've got to have those talking points in front of you, those, those points. Um, it may be a thing where each of you writes out that longer story, and then you get mm -hmm. together and figure out how to push those stories together and then yeah. condense them. If you're working with a, with a small group of people like that and making a presentation together, I think it's really important to script it out. Um, and that you actually rehearse together a little bit and you plan it out. And I know a lot of us want to just be able to show up and, you know, off the fly do something amazing. Uh, but before we go on stage for almost every single show we do, you and I still, uh, we write up a script for what we're doing and we run it through a couple of times. And we've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. Right. But it really makes a difference. And so just, you know, script it out. Create that outline together and practice. That's and then also decide amongst the three of you how you will toss it to each other. Mm. And don't be afraid to let that be um, something that you speak out loud. Um, Mindy, over to you. Or Mindy, it's, you know, Mindy, you know, say the person's name if you have to. Um, it doesn't have to be a mystery how it flows. Like a beautiful choral arrangement is one thing flows into another. But um, what's more important, again, what's always more important is getting the story across. How does However you can make that happen, make that happen. And you guys are going to, the three of you will decide how you're going to make that happen. Yeah. Can I just add yes. matching outfits? Matching outfits. <laughs> All right. Of next course. question. <laughs> All right. Um, is there a good way to frame your story in a way that your audience finds applicability to their field or sees your case study as informative to what you're doing? Mm. No. And you know what? Don't worry about it because everybody's going to project their own What's going on for them, that's what they're going to see and what you're saying. Um, so I don't think you have to worry too much about catering to uh, other people's specific situations. Um, having said that, it's obviously most effective when you're communicating with other people if you use concrete details and examples, um, which is what you're going to be doing because you're going to be telling specific stories in your presentation. Um, and when you give a concrete detail in a story um, that is more relatable than an abstract idea or a generalization. So, you know, just don't sweat it too much. People are going to, they're, they're, they're going to be coming from their own field and their own area of expertise, so they're already going to hear what they want to hear insofar as they're already going to be filtering what you're saying through their own uh, work. And, um, you know, as and hopefully during the Q&A, they give you a chance to address specifics, which you may or may not be able to address. But I wouldn't worry about that as much in preparing for your story. Yeah, just a small add-on. I think in that Q&A is where sometimes you can tie their field to what you talked about. That's usually they're going to ask a question from their field that allows mm -hmm. you to make that connection if it's something that you can do. Yeah. All right. We have time for one more question. Okay. All right. Um, Emily, actually, the organizer of the conference, has a question um, that I'm hoping will support some of the folks out there interested in submitting a proposal. Workshops are 90 minutes. Is it a good idea to tell several short stories or try to tell one longer story? Mm. Well, that depends on how much time you have. 90, minute, 90 minutes is the whole conference, and you want to have Q&A in that and everything as well? Okay. So... 
we have nine. There's literally going to be a presentation in 90 minutes. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. I How think, many stories can you fit into that 90 minutes? Yeah, I think, is it, um, so would it be fair to say that um, potentially doing three seven-minute stories with different points of view might be more effective? Yeah, that's kind of the question. Like, do you do you get uh, the, all of the presenters to tell one short story about their work, or do you get them all to tell a collective story that's longer? Or you know, how do you work that out? And then how do you make the biggest impact with those words? Mm. I would I would want to select. I mean, the way I would approach it probably is to get five to six you know people to each tell a five minute, six minutes, how you know, however you're timing it out. Uh, story about their organization or some or a success story or something about what the work that they've been doing yeah I think because that that I think really nicely ties back to the idea that you probably have more, more than one point you want to make or more than one idea you want to get across and if you have these three or four stories each one of those people can pick one of those things and their narrative will be very cohesive and they can so that people will walk away with oh Emily's story the takeaway I got from her story was this, and that's really impactful for my work mostly, or this one, or who I'm dealing with, or my clients, or whatever. And um, yeah. and whoever so the lead presenter is, um, which might be you, um, you know, would have the opportunity after everybody's told their story to sort of recap for a second and tell everybody, you know, this is what is important, and this is, you know, just spell it out. Um, this is what we're talking about to wrap it up and be able to have. I call them, this is a, a jargon nobody should ever use, but I do it all the time. It's called the uh, vertical moments. Moments when you sort of rise above what's happening and you, and you have a moment of real perspective and you, uh, you have a perspective you want to get out of all of these stories that you're hearing, a, a sort of a bigger idea or a bigger message or something you're hoping for that's happening. And that's the vertical moment is the time that you decide to spell that out and say, here's what is amazing about yeah, what's going thing. on right now and just say the thing. Um, but I would do that rather than trying to worry about coordinating one long presentation um, amongst people. Uh, yeah, but, but ahead of time, I would make all of those people rehearse their story with you over the phone tell, so that you knew what everybody was going to say if you're the head presenter. Um, that would give you a chance ahead of time to know what was coming Right. Um, and to be able to prepare some remarks of your own for the introductions um, maybe to what the stories are about and to the closing that you want to make. And just um, a thing that I want to say, if you are the person that's kind of hearing these, you're the head person that's maybe going to be hearing the stories and maybe giving feedback, um, sometimes I know it's hard to give direct feedback to people. You know, they're, they've got a story and um, you might just want to say, oh, that's great. Right? Yeah, you don't want to hurt your mom's feelings. You don't want to, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But here's the thing. I want you to think about any time that you're working with somebody on a story, that the story lives between the two of you. It's not personal. And what you want is for them to present and be the best that they can be on stage. And if mm -hmm. that's your focus, again, is that whole thing about, like, whenever you're dealing with somebody, is to, to, to you know, start out with, like, a good thing about their story, but to say, use your language of, like, you know, I really like this part, but I think it could be even more impactful if you said this or you included this. Or I think when you include this, it takes you off of that narrative track and makes you less impactful. So don't be afraid to give notes. It's really, really, really important, and, it's, and it, it is actually in the end the most supportive thing that you can do. So just give yourself that permission um, to hear that feedback if you're the storyteller or the person presenting um, and to give that feedback if you're the person directing. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? It went a little off. So uh, we just want to close. You know, we talked beforehand. This is something I hope you guys do with your own stories. We decided ahead of time. We know this is a lot of information, and this, and storytelling is. I mean, first of all, anybody can do it. And having said that, this is an art form. And so far as you you get better with practice. Yes. Um, so one of the most helpful things I know Frame said to me once was. Um, just decide, you know, before you go on stage, decide on maybe three things tops that you want to accomplish. Um, and maybe you'll, and maybe you'll get one of those. And maybe sometimes it's like, all right, I, my goal with this story, uh, is to 
you know, not do that weird thing I do with my hands. And if I can get through this story doing that one thing, then I'm going to count it as success, um, even if I don't get the standing O. Um, so uh, this is a lot of information, but pick a few things to kind of work on at a time with yourself. Um, Make them tangible things that right. are, yes, I accomplished this, or, you know, next time I'm going to work on that thing. And do that every single time. And sometimes there are things that I do that before I prepare, and there are things that have stayed on my list of three for forever because I continually have to work on that thing. And that is okay. And mm -hmm. just I just I always want to encourage people to give themselves a break. There's going to be a time where you kill it, and you're going to think, I nailed my three things, and the next time you go out, it's going to seem like you're kind of phoning it in. But go back to those three things, What was? and those are the tangible things that you can go, oh, you know what, um, I didn't drive towards my aha moment this time. I kind of, you know, I didn't come on stage prepared like I normally do. And work in those tangible things instead of the intangibles, which is, like, did everybody in the audience love me? Or, like, these things that you have, mm -hmm. work with the things that you have control over. Yeah, and, you know, our final note would be if there was three things we wanted you to remember, three points about what's going to make your story great, your presentation great, it is, number one, pare it down. Pare it down. <laughs> keep it short. Keep it succinct. Don't talk about everything. Pare it down. Number two, nail the aha. Um, remember, the most important thing you're driving towards with your story is that uh, that moment of insight and awareness that you had that you want everyone else to have by telling this story. And you're going to nail it if you really plan for it and work towards it. And number three, <laughs> what would you write down? Ratitude. Um, a rad attitude. Um, it really makes a big difference if you pump yourself up beforehand and you go out with um, some confidence and a smile on your face. So three things, pare it down, nail the aha, and ratitude. <laughs> I can't say that without <laughs> laughing. Yes. Thank you so much for listening to us blab yeah. on about this today. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you had an aha moment. Yeah, great. <laughs> It's been so wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to advance these slides really quickly just so that our information is available here. And um, this, there will be a recording of this available probably early next week. I just linked to it in the chat box. And then I'm also going to send our survey. It literally will take you less than a minute to complete, and it would be so helpful for us if you, if you did that. So we'd really appreciate it. And our contact information is above. Um, I'm Tracy. Emily is the organizer of the conference. You can email her there. And if you want to check out Back Fence, their website is, is uh, on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mindy and Frayne, for sure. joining us. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.